Do you not see that you can expect no help from Zeus? And at the moment, the son of Kronos is allowing Hector there to carry all before him. But only for the day. Another day, our turn will come, if he is kind. However bold a man may be, he cannot run counter to the will of Zeus, who is far more powerful than we are. All that, sir, is very true, said Diomedes at the loud war cry, and yet it cuts me to the quick to think of Hector holding forth and saying to the Trojans, Tydides ran for me. He didn't stop before he reached the ships. He is sure to brag like that when he does. May the earth swallow me up. What nonsense, my dear sir, from the son of the doughty Tydeus, replied Gerenian Nestor. Hector can dub you coward and milk stop to his heart's content but he will not convince the Trojans and Dardanians, nor those proud spearmen's wives whose loving husbands you have flung down into the dust. With no more said, he wheeled the horses round and drove them back in flight across the rout. Hector and the Trojans followed them up with a terrific roar and a hail of deadly missiles. And the great Hector of the glittering helmet raised a shout of triumph over Diomedes. Tydides, he cried, the Danan horsemen used to honor you with the best seat at the table, the first cut of the joint, and a never empty cup. They will not think so well of you today. After all, you are no better than a woman. Off with you, wretched doll. No cowardice of mine is going to let you climb our walls or carry off our women in your ships. I shall see you off to Hades first. Tydides, when he heard this, had half a mind to turn his horses and meet Hector face to face. Thrice he was on the point of doing so, and thrice the counselor Zeus thundered from Mount Ida as a sign to the Trojans that victory was theirs with help from him. And there was Hector calling aloud to his men, Trojans and Lycians and you Dardanians, that like your fighting hand to hand, be men, my friends, do justice to your valor. I am convinced that Zeus is on my side. He has assured me of a triumphant victory and disaster to the Danans. Fools that they are to have gone and made those flimsy, futile walls which will not hold us for an instant. As for the trench they have dug, our horses will jump that with ease. And once I get among the hollow ships, let your Watchword be fire. I want to see those ships go up in flames and the Argives lurching about in the smoke and falling dead beside their hulls. Hector turned to his horses, called them each by name, and talked to them. Xanthus and you, Pedargus, Athon, and my noble Lampus, repay me now for the attention lavished on you by Adromache, a great king's daughter, who has always hastened to put honeyed wheat before you and mix you wine to drink at your pleasure before she thought of serving me, who claim to be her loving husband. After them now at the gallop, and let us capture Nestor's shield. The talk of heaven itself, of solid gold, they say, shield, bars, and all, or tear the inlaid breastplate that 
Hephaestus made for him from the shoulders of horse-taming Diomedes. If we could lay our hands on those pieces, I should hope to make the Achaeans take to their fast ships this very night. Hector's vainglorious tone was resented by the Lady Hera. With an impatient movement on her throne, which made high Olympus quake, she turned to the great god Poseidon and said, Imperial Earthshaker, I am distressed to see that even you can find no pity in your heart for the Danans in their downfall. Yet at Hellas and Agi, they make you many pleasing offerings. Can you not bring yourself to wish them victory? Why, if we who are on the side made up our minds to keep all-seeing Zeus from interfering and to thrust the Trojans back, what a sorry god he would be sitting alone there on Ida. Hera, replied the lord of the earthquake, with the utmost indignation. These are valid words indeed, even from your unruly tongue. Far be it from me to join the others in a fight with Zeus, the son of Kronos, who is so much stronger than us all. While these two were talking to one another, the whole enclosure between the ships and the trench by the wall was filled with a medley of chariots and armed men, penned in like sheep by that peer of the impetuous war god Hector, son of Priam, now that Zeus had given him the upper hand. Indeed, he would have had the trim ships alight and going up in flames if the Lady Hera had not put it into Agamemnon's head to bestir himself and rally the Achaeans before it was too late. He went along, past huts and ships with a large purple cloak, gripped in his great hand, and climbed up on the bulging black hull of Odysseus' ship, which stood in the center of the line so that a man's voice would carry to either end, to the huts of Telamonian Aeus, or to those of Achilles, who had had confidence enough in their own bravery and strength to draw up their trim ships on the extreme flanks. From this point, Agamemnon sent his voice ringing out to the whole Danan army. For shame, Argives! he cried. Contemptible creatures, splendid only on parade. What has become of our assurance that we were the finest force on earth? What of the idle boasts you made that time in Lemnos as you gorged yourselves on the beef of straight-horned cattle and drank from bowls brimful of wine? You said that in a fight you could each stand up to a hundred, nay, two hundred Trojans, whereas today the whole crowd of us are no match for Hector alone, and he, before long, will have the ships going up in flames. Father Zeus was a great king ever fooled by you like this, and robbed of all his glory? Can I yet claim that on my unhappy journey here in my ship of war, I never overlooked a single one of your fine altars. On every one of them, I burnt the fat and thighs of bullocks in my eagerness to bring down the walls of Troy. Ah, Zeus, grant me this prayer at least. Let us escape with our lives if nothing else, and do not let the Trojans overwhelm us like this. Thus Agamemnon prayed, and the father was moved by his tears. With a nod of his head, he vouchsafed him 
the salvation of his army, and at the same time sent out an eagle, best of prophetic birds, with its talons in a fawn, the offspring of some nimble doe. The eagle dropped the fawn by the splendid altar of Zeus, where the Achaeans used to sacrifice to the father of the oracles. And when they realized that the bird came from Zeus, they fell on the Trojans with a better will and recalled the joy of battle. Then not one of the many Danan charioteers could boast that he had raced Diomedes to the trench and driven out before him to engage the enemy. Diomedes was certainly the first to kill a Trojan man at arms. His victim, Agelaus, son of Phradmon, had swung his horses round for flight. He had no sooner wheeled round than Diomedes caught him in the back with his spear, midway between the shoulders, and drove it through his breast. He crashed from his chariot, and his armor rang about him. Diomedes was followed by the Atridae, Agamemnon, and Menelaus, these by the two Aeantes, dauntless and resolute, and these again by Idomeneus and Idomeneus squire, Meriones, a peer of the man-killing war god, and by these Eripylus, Erimon's noble son, the ninth to sally out, bending his curved bow, was Teucer, who took his usual place behind the shield of Aeus' son of Telamon. Aeus would slowly move his shield aside. Teucer would peer about for a target in the crowd and shoot. Then, as the man he hit dropped dead, Teucer, like a child running for shelter to his mother's skirts, took cover once again with Aeus, who hid him under his glittering shield. Who was the first of the Trojans to fall to the peerless Teucer? Orsilochus, then Ormenus, then Ophelatites, Dater, and Chromius and the godlike like Cophantes and Amopeon, Polyamon's son, and Melinippus, all these in swift succession he brought down on the bountiful earth. Agamemnon, king of men, was delighted when he saw what havoc Teucer was making in the Trojan ranks with his strong bow. He went up to him and said, Teucer, son of Telamon, my beloved prince, shoot on as you are doing now, and may you well bring salvation to the Danans and fame to your father Telamon, who took you under his roof and reared you through a bastard child. Repay him now with glory, far away as he is, and I tell you what I undertake to do. If Aegis bearing Zeus and Athena ever let me sack the lovely town of Troy, I will hand you the first prize of honor after my own, a tripod or a pair of horses with their chariot or a woman to share your bed. My noble lord, Atreides, said the admirable Teucer. Why flog a willing horse? I have been doing all I can without a rest. From the moment when we thrust them back towards the town, I have been watching for chances with my bow and picking men off. I have shot eight long barbed arrows, and each has found its mark in the flesh of some fighting youngster over there. But here is a mad dog 
whom I cannot hit. As he spoke, he aimed at Hector, whom he yearned to bring down and sent another arrow flying from his string. He missed him and sent, but the arrow landed in the beast of one of Priam's noble sons, peerless Gorgithion, whose mother, the lovely Chastinaria, with a figure like a goddess, had come from Azami to be married to the king. Weighed down by his helmet, Gorgithion's head dropped to one side, like the lolling head of a garden poppy, weighed down by its seed and the showers of spring. Once more in his eagerness to get him, Teucer aimed at Hector and sent an arrow flying from his string. He missed him this time too, for Apollo turned his dart aside, but he hit arched Ptolemus, Hector's daring charioteer, by the nipple on his breast. As he was galloping into the fight, he crashed from his chariot, making his horses shy, and died where he fell. The death of his charioteer wrung Hector's heart, but sorry as he was for his comrade in arms, he left him there and called upon his brother, Cebriones, who happened to be near, to take the horse's reins. Cebriones heard him and obeyed him. Hector himself leapt to the ground from his resplendent chariot with a terrible shout, picked up a lump of rock, and made straight for Teucer, whom he had determined to kill. Teucer had just taken a sharp arrow from his quiver and put it on the string. As he drew back the string and aimed at him, Hector of the flashing helmet struck his shoulder with the jagged stone on the weakest spot where the clavicle leads over to the neck and breast. The bowstring snapped. His fingers and wrist were numbed. He sank down on his knees and the bow dropped from his hand. But Aeus did not disregard his brother's fall. Running up, he bestrode Teucer and covered him with his shield. Then two of their trusty men, Mextius, son of Echius, and the noble Alistair, lifted him from the ground and carried him off, groaning heavily to the hollow ships. Olympian Zeus now put fresh heart into the Trojans, and they drove the Achaeans right back to their own deep trench. Hector, resistless and elated, led the van, like a hound in full cry after a lion or a wild boar, snapping at flank or buttock, and following every twist and turn, he hung on the heels of the long-haired Achaeans, killing the hindmost all the time as they ran before him. They fled across, across the palisade and trench, suffering heavy losses at the hands of the Trojans, and they did not stop till they reached the ships. There they halted, calling to one another for help, and every man lifted up his hands and poured out prayers to all the gods. But there was Hector, wheeling his long-maned horse to and fro, and glaring at them with the eyes of Gorgo, or the murderous war god. The white-armed goddess Hera was sorry for them when she saw their plight and did not conceal her distress from Athena. Daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, she said to her, can you look, and I look on, without a final effort while the Danans perish? For that they will, and miserably too, mowed down by a single man, 
see what Hector has done to them already. And now there is no stopping him in his mad career. Nothing could please me more, said the bright-eyed goddess Athena, than to see that mad career cut short and have him killed on his native soil by Argive hands. But my father is in a wicked mood, obstinate old sinner that he is, always meddling with my plans. He never thinks of the many times I went to his son Heracles' rescue when he was defeated by the tasks of Erythenus set him. Heracles had only to whimper to heaven and Zeus would send me speeding down to get him out of his difficulties. If my prophetic heart had warned me of all this when Eurythesis sent us him down to the house of Hades, warden of the gates, to bring the hound of hell from Erebus, he would never have recrossed the cataracts of Styx. But now Hades hates me and is letting Thetis have her way, because she kisses his knees and touched his chin with her hand when she begged him to support Achilles, sacker of towns. However, the day will come when he will call me his darling of the flashing eyes once more. Meanwhile, you will get our horses ready while I go into the palace of Aegis bearing Zeus and arm for war. I want to see how pleased this son of Priam, Hector of the flashing helmet, will be when we show two of ourselves athwart the ranks. It is now the Trojans' turn to fall dead by the Achaean ships and glut the dogs and birds of prey with their fat and flesh. To this the white-armed goddess made no demure. So Hera, queen of heaven and daughter of the mighty Kronos, went off to put the golden harness on her horses, while on her father's threshold, Athena, daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, shed the soft embroidered robe which she had made with her own hands, put on a tunic in its place, and equipped herself for the lamentable work of war with the arms of Zeus, the cloud compeller. Then she stepped into the flaming chariot, gripping the huge long spear with which she breaks the noble warrior's ranks when she the Almighty Father's child is roused to anger. And no sooner was she in than Hera started the horses with her whip. The gates of heaven thundered upon and opened for them of their own accord. They are kept by the hours, the wardens of the broad sky and of Olympus, whose task it is to close the entrance or to roll away the heavy cloud. Through these gates, the goddesses drove their patient steeds. When Father Zeus saw them from Ida, he was enraged and at once told Iris of the golden wings to convey a message to them. Off with you, Iris, fast as you can, he said, Make them turn back. Do not let them meet me face to face. It would be a terrible thing for them to fight with Zeus. Tell them from me, who make no idle threats, that I will hamstring the horses they are driving. Hurl them both from their chariot and break the chariot up. Ten rolling years would pass, and they would not be healed of the wounds my thunderbolt would deal them. That will teach the Lady of the Flashing Eyes what it means to fight against her father. As for Hera, I am so much hurt and angered by her. It is her instinct to defy me. Iris of the Whirlwind Feet sped off on her mission 
from the peaks of Ida to great Olympus. And there, on the rugged heights of Olympus, she met the two goddesses at the very gates, stopped them, and delivered the message from Zeus. Whither away? she said. What is the object of this mad adventure? The son of Kronos forbids you to assist the Argives. Hear what he threatens, and you know that Zeus keeps his word. He will hamstring your horses you were driving, hurl you both from the chariot, and break the chariot up. Ten rolling years would pass, and you be left still suffering from the wounds his thunderbolts would deal you. That lady of the flashing eyes will teach you what it means to fight your father. It is not Hera who, habit who habitually defies his orders that has hurt and angered him so much as you and your graceless, brazen impudence. If you really dare to brandish that great spear of yours at Zeus. Her message delivered, Iris of the fleet foot, foot took her leave, and Hera turned to Athena in alarm. Daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, she said, I have changed my mind. We too will not go to war with Zeus on man's behalf. Let chance settle who is to die or live. Zeus must decide in his own mind between the Trojans and Danans, as is only right. As she spoke, she turned their chariot back. The hours unyoked their long-maned horses for them, tethered them at their ambrosial mangers, and tilted the chariot against the burnished wall by the gate, while the two goddesses rejoined the other gods in their great chagrin and sat down on golden chairs. Meanwhile, Father Zeus had left Ida and was driving his fast chariot and horses to Olympus. He too was served when he reached the home of the gods. The illustrious earth shaker unyoked his horses, put his chariot on its stand, and covered it with a cloth. All-seeing Zeus himself sat down on his golden throne, and great Olympus quaked beneath his feet. Athena and Hera, sitting by themselves away from Zeus, said not a word to him, and asked him nothing. But he knew what was passing through their minds, and he said, Athena and Hera, why are you so dejected, not worn out surely by the glorious battle in which you killed so many of the Trojans whom you loathe? I now could never be turned from my path by all the gods in Olympus, such is the strength of my unconquerable hands. But you too were trembling in every limb before you even saw the battlefield and its horrors. Let me tell you what would have happened if you had not changed your minds. My thunderbolt would have wrecked you, and if you had got home to Olympus, it would have been in someone else's chariot. This sally drew mutterings from Athena and Hera, where they sat together, still plotting trouble for the Trojans. However, Athena held her tongue. For all her annoyance with her father Zeus, she made no rejoinder, though she seized with indignation. But Hera could not contain her rage and burst into speech. Dread son of Kronos, this is intolerable. We know as well as all the rest that your powers are not to be despised, but we cannot help being sorry for the Danon spearmen left as they will be to destruction and a miserable fate. However, it is your wish we will refrain from fighting and contend ourselves with giving sound advice to the Argives, so that they may not all come to grief 
through your anger. To this, the cloud compeller Zeus replied, Hera, my ox-eyed queen, you will have the opportunity at dawn tomorrow of seeing the almighty son of Kronos do greater execution yet among the spearmen of the Argive force. For I tell you that the mighty Hector is going to give his enemies no rest till swift Achilles comes to life again beside the ships. When they are fighting at the very sterns in desperate straits over the body of Patroclus, that is decreed by heaven. As for yourself, your annoyance leaves me calm. For all I care, you can go to the bottomless pit and join Iapetus and Kronos, who never enjoyed the beams of Hyperion the sun, nor any breezes, sunk as they are in the depths of Tartarus. You can descend as far as that, and your anger will still leave me unconcerned. There are no limits to your impudence. This time, the white-armed goddess said not a word in answer. And now the bright lamp of the sun dropped into ocean, drawing back black night in its train across the fruitful earth. The Trojans had not wished the day to end, but to the Achaeans, who had yearned for this relief, the dark came like a tardy answer to their prayers. Illustrious Hector withdrew the Trojans from the ships and summoned a meeting in an open space beside the swirling river, where the ground was clear of corpses and they got down from their chariots to hear what the king's son had to say. He held a spear, eleven cubits long, the bronze point glittering in front of him, and there was a gold ring round the top of the shaft. As he addressed his troops, he rested his weight on the spear. Trojans, Dardanians, and allies, listen to me, he said. I am hoped to destroy the ships and all the Achaeans with them before going home to windy Ilium. But the light failed too soon. It was that more than anything that saved the Argives and their fleet on the seashore. Now we can only do as night suggests and prepare for supper. Unyoke your long-maned horses and put fodder by them. Then quickly go and bring some cattle and fat sheep from the town and supply yourselves with mellow wine and bread from your houses. Also, collect a quantity of wood so that we can have plenty of fires burning all night till dawn and light up the whole sky in case the long-haired Achaeans make a dash for home, in spite of the darkness, and take to the open sea. We must certainly not leave them to embark at their leisure. Let us give those fellows something to digest at home, an arrow or a sharp spear in the back as they jump on board to teach them and other people too to think twice of the miseries of war before they attack the horse taming Trojans. In Troy itself, let our sacred heralds call out the young lads and the gray-headed old men to biovac all round the town on the walls that the gods built us, while our womenfolk keep a big fire burning in every home. In addition, regular guards must be mounted to see that the enemy do not steal into the city while the troops are away. Those gallant Trojans are my orders. Let them be carried out. So much for the moment. I think that we can say, all's well. In the morning I will announce my 
further disposition to the troops. I hope and pray to Zeus and all the other gods that I shall be able to drive away these hellhounds whom the fates bring here in their black ships. It is night now. We must mount guard for ourselves as well. But at peep of dawn we will arm and attack them fiercely at the hollow ships. Then I shall see whether the mighty Diomedes of Titus can drive me back from the ships to the wall, or whether I shall bring him down with my razor-sharp bronze and carry off his blood-stained arms. He will learn in the morning whether he has it in him to stand up against my spear. More likely, as tomorrow's sun goes up, he will lie bleeding in the battle front with half his company dead around their leader. I wish I were sure of immortality and ageless youth and glory like Athena's or Apollo's, as I am that this day will prove disastrous to the Argives. The Trojans greeted this harangue from Hector with applause. They freed their sweating horses from the yokes and tethered them with thongs, each man by his own chariot. Then they went quickly to the town and brought out oxen and fat sheep, supplying themselves at the same time with mellow wine and bread from their homes. They also collected large quantities of wood, and presently the smell of roast meat was rising to high heaven on the breeze. Thus all night long they sat across the corridors of battle, thinking great thoughts and keeping their many fires alight. There are nights when the upper air is windless and the stars in heaven stand out in their full splendor round the bright moon, when every mountain top and headland and ravine starts into sight as the infinite depths of the sky are torn open to the very firmament when every star is seen and the shepherd rejoices. Such and so many were the Trojans' fires twinkling in front of Ilium midway between the ships and the streams of Xanthus there were a thousand fires burning on the plain, and round each one sat fifty men in the light of its blaze, while the horses stood beside their chariots, munching white barley and rye, and waiting for dawn to take her golden throne. <laughs>